Amen. You ready for the word this morning? Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you that we approach the throne of grace today in faith, knowing that you are a good, good father. And every good and every perfect gift comes down from the father of lights in whom there is no shadow or variableness of turning. We thank you today that Jesus, you have come to give us life and life more abundantly. And because of the covenant that we have with you, even today as we will in a moment celebrate communion of the Lord's Supper together, we thank you that it will come alive and meaningful in a real way, Lord, as we receive everything that you willed and wrought for us. And Father, we thank you for quickening us today, opening every heart and mind to receive your word as as we are hungry for it, and by being doers of the word and not hearers only, we will be blessed in our deeds. And everyone agree with that, said amen in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going we're gonna to possibly finish our series today uh, that I've been doing uh, for quite a while on eliminating fear, amen. And we know the word eliminate means to completely remove or to get rid of something that is fears power over our life. You know, the truth is, we all live in a fear-stricken world, and but we do not have to be overcome by it. And um, the, the thing it is that we understand, when, we, when we're talking about eliminating fear from our life, it doesn't mean that we won't feel it or have to face it. It just means that we, it, we won't allow it to be Lord over our life or control our lives any longer. We can do something to make the word of God so real that fear is resisted, it, it is repelled in our lives, and it is not controlling us. We're not making decisions based upon fear, but upon faith. Amen. And so today in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, we're going to look there again. This has been the scripture verse that we've launched out on, and every time is a perfect one because God said, the scripture says, I've not given you a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Everybody say sound mind. Praise the Lord. And so we found that really a sound mind is the key to our victory is the key to our victory. Now, we're going to have a slide up defining sound mind. Sound mind, once again, I'm reminding us, when we read this, what does it mean that when God says, I'm not giving you a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind? Sound mind is God's admonition. This is what we found, and calling to soundness of mind, to moderation, and to self-control. In other words, admonition is the authoritative counsel or warning. So what God is saying here, here's what we can come to find out. What God God is saying, when he says, I'm not giving you a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind, God is saying this here, that he calls us to do something with our minds, and it's called controlling them. It's an admonition. It's a warning that we have to do something with our minds, and renewing them is the first and most important step in having a sound mind. And so, for anyone that doesn't know what renewing of the mind is, it lets us know very clearly in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, the, the, uh, the Apostle Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said it like this, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that which is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Amen. And so this is why the renewing of our mind is so important. And it's the first step in having a, a sound mind or doing something with our mind. You know, God did something in us that we couldn't do ourselves. That is save us and change our inward man, change our spirit. In other words, when we made Jesus the Lord of life, we were born again. He created us or recreated us anew in Christ Jesus. He changed the, the inside of us. He changed the real us 
us as spirits. But he left us to do something with our minds and with our bodies. We're to submit our bodies to the will of God, but we're to submit our minds to the will of God or the word of God as well. And we're to do that, we have to renew it. Renew means to exchange our way of thinking for God's way of thinking. And this is why it says that we're not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed. And we're transformed in life. You and I as believers will be changed to the degree that our minds are renewed. We either live in the spirit or in the flesh to the degree our minds are renewed. And so this is what we have to know because as our minds are renewed, then we find what the will of God is. And then from that place, we can do the will of God and our life is transformed. Now, we're going to put up the next slide. And this is why we've said, I'm recapping a little bit for us all as today. This is why we said thoughts are the most important thing in your life. Did you know thoughts are the most important thing in your life? Because here's why. Because there was never a, there was never a, there was never a word or an action that was not a first a thought in your mind. Come on. That's why you are attacked in your mind by the enemy of your soul, Satan. And this is why we must learn to take control of our thoughts. Because thoughts are the most important thing in your life. Because as your thought goes, so goes your life. And this is why it says that, that God's not giving us a spirit of fear, but this admonition of power, love, and a sound mind. Matter of fact, we'll never walk in in a Love or power without first having a sound mind because we won't think right. If you don't think right, you won't believe right. If you don't think and believe right, you won't talk right. If you don't think right, believe right, and talk right, right, you won't act right. So it all begins with thoughts, and this is why we say thoughts are the most important thing in our life. And if you're ever going to eradicate or eliminate fear from your life, you're going to have to take control of your thoughts. Amen. Controlling them means to think right. And if we're going to think right, you know what thinking right means? It means to think in line with God's Word. In other words, think in line with what God said. Come on, about himself. He's a good, good father. We just sang about it. You're going to have to think in line with what the word says. Not what somebody told you. Come on. Not what you saw on television. Come on. But what the word of God says. You're going to have to think in line with what God says about himself and, as importantly, about what he says about you. Because you can think, you could actually think he's a good father, but he's good to everybody else but you. you got to understand what he thinks about you as well. And when you understand that you are his masterpiece, come on. E- Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 lets us know he, we are his workmanship, New Living Translation. We are his, his masterpiece recreated in Christ Jesus. You are the treasure hid in the field. You are the pearl of great price. Come on. You are what God says you are, and he is is who he says he is. And so you're going to have to understand that we're going to have to get our minds controlled by thinking in line with God's word, and that would include what he says about himself and ultimately what he says about you as well. Praise the Lord. Now, we're going to put up the next slide because this is so important. Listen, while thoughts are the most important thing, our words are the most powerful thing. Come on. While our thoughts are the most important thing, our words are the most powerful thing in our life. Why? Because we create our world, we create our experience that way. We both change our thoughts and create our world with our words. That's what we do. And see, what we have to understand is we've been lied to by but many times by religion, and we've been lied to, obviously, by the devil. But God created us in his likeness, in his image, and in, in his plan never changed. When man sinned, God's plan never changed for man. If you go back and read the original design for man, God said in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, that he made us in his likeness, in his image. He gave us authority and dominion over all the earth. Well, our image didn't change. 
when we sinned. But what happened was, when God's plan didn't change, but what happened is we actually sold out under sin or sold out under Satan, and Satan uh, took at that authority. In other words, we became traitors. We committed high treason against God, and mankind, because of sin, that the, the fallen nature of, of of it came upon us. And when man sinned, he died. He died spiritually. And in dying spiritually, we die physically. And death came upon all man through Adam. God had, to, God had a plan. His plan, didn't, his plan didn't change for man to walk with God. So here's what he had to do. He had to come himself. Because, but he came, he came in, a, in the form of a man. Just like a man got us in this mess, a man will get us out of this mess. But not just any man, the God man. Amen. Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Godhead, actually came. The perfect, sinless, spotless Son of God came, shed his blood, paid the price for our sin, died and went to hell and paid the price for all of us. And when our sins were pardoned and we could be justified, God raised him from the dead to prove that he was the divine son of God. And, he, and whoever would believe on him could receive eternal life, be redeemed, and God would restore back not only the relationship, but also the authority that man lost in the garden. Can I get an amen? So the truth is, our words are, are powerful. I said it earlier, words are powerful. Take them seriously. Words will be your salvation. Words can also be your damnation. Death and life, Proverbs 18.21, is in death and life on the power of the tongue. They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So we, eat, we are all the time either speaking life to our life or death to our life. You choose by the words that you speak. And so this is why we said, while thoughts are the most important thing, words are the most powerful things. The, once again, the reason why thoughts are the most important thing is because there was never a word that was not first a thought. Come on, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You say, well, I slipped, I couldn't help it, the devil made me do it or whatever. No, 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 no. You thought about it first. Come on. You thought about giving that person the peace of your mind and you went ahead and said it. Come on. You know what I'm talking about. I don't know where that came from. I know where it came from. It came from a thought. And it, it, it might not have originated with you, but nonetheless, whether it came from you, the devil, or somebody else telling you to say it, it came in a thought, a thought form. And if you yielded to that, then you said words that produce a negative effect or words that produce a positive effect. So while our thoughts are the most important thing, our words are the most powerful thing because whether we realize it or not, we create our world, our experience this way. And if we're going to change our thoughts, amen, if we have to cast down imaginations, what we talked about in other messages, if we have to change the way we think, then the first way to do that is by with words, because if you th say, if I say blue car, big house, tall person, big building, you saw all those things with what? Words. So when the enemy comes with you with thoughts in your mind, the best way and the most powerful and effective way to change those pictures is with words. But not just any words, God's word. When Satan tempted Jesus, he always came back with the word. He always says, it is written. He released what he believed through words, and that's what you and I are going to have to do to combat our thoughts and our minds. Amen. We got to realize this. You can't be a silent giant. Come on. We want, listen, God, God sees us maybe different than we see ourselves, but we got to see ourselves the way God sees us. But if God says you're a winner, I can tell you, you can't be a silent winner. You're going to have to be able, and you can't be a silent giant. God sees his church as a, a giant in there. It may be sleeping, but I'm waking us up today, and I'm letting you know you can't be a silent giant and win. You're going to have to open your mouth because you're thinking different thoughts. God's thoughts. And if we don't like what we're experiencing in life, now this may be a tough pill to swallow, but the sooner we swallow it and realize it, the better off we are. 
Because this is true for all of us, not just you, not it, but, but me as well. If we don't like, come on, if we don't like what we're experiencing in life, then we must ex- examine our thoughts and our words because like it or not, they are either binding us or freeing us. I'm going to say it again. If we don't like what we're experiencing in life, then we need to examine our thoughts and our words because the truth is the result we are getting in our life right now are the direct result or the, or the, pro, the product of our thoughts and words yesterday. What we're experiencing today are direct, direct result of our thoughts and words from yesterday. The good news is we can change that. If that's true, and it is, then we can change it. Amen. And so what that means is, the good news is we, we can all change it. Come on. Amen. And, and even if our life, here's the great thing is, so for many of you, you say, well, I don't do all that wrong. I, I've changed that. The good news is we can even improve on it. Because you shouldn't be just happy with where you are. This is no time to coast. This is no time to put it in neutral. Because this is no time to just say, I've arrived. Come on. Because there's not one person that's arrived. There's not one person in here that is everything that God wants them to be in experience. I mean, you may be it positionally, but our faith takes what God positionally gives us and makes it an experience. And that's what we all are growing in. Can I get amen in here today? And so we have to understand that the good news is that we can all change. If we're doing it wrong, we can do it right. If we're doing it right, we can do it even better. We can improve on that. And this is what this series has all been about. And and more importantly, show us how. So today I want to talk about, in closing today, amen, I want to talk about the steadfast mind. Everybody say steadfast. I want to talk about this steadfast mind. I want to look at a verse in the Bible uh, in Isaiah 26, verse 3. I want you to look at this with me. Isaiah 26, 3. I'll give you a moment to turn there. We're going to read it from three translations today, beginning with the King James Version. The Scripture says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. So in other words, if you want the peace that passes all understanding, if you want the peace that God gives, and that's what we all need in this life, then here's how it comes, by whose mind is stayed upon them. Because the mind that stayed on him shows that we trust in him. See, here's what happens. We can either have our mind on him or our mind on a problem. If we are, a tendency is, is always to go to the problem and focus on that. You know what you trust in? You trust in the problem. And when you trust the problem, guess what you have? A problem. <laughs> Amen. It's not that hard. Praise the Lord. So what happens is the mind that is stayed on him, it doesn't mean that there's not going to be the wrong thoughts that come, but we address them. We cast them down. We replace them with God's word. We speak God's word to that, and then we, we put our thoughts and our attention on God's word, and then that shows we trust in God, and that will bring peace into our lives. We've got to learn to do that. Because we have been trained before we were saved to think and think negatively. We live in a fallen world, church. We live in a fallen world. And just because you you got saved or born again doesn't mean you think right. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us we won't think right until our minds are renewed with the Word of God. So this is an ongoing process. The mind renewal is for the rest of your life. It's, it's actually in the Greek, it means a continual ongoing process because your mind could be renewed about finances, but not renewed about health. Your mind could be renewed about health, but not walking in love. Your mind could be renewed about coming to church, but not about faith in God. Come on. It could be renewed in certain areas. And that's our temptation is to categorize God. Like put him in a box, but God is bigger than any box that we can put him in. And he's so big that it means that he wants to touch every area of our life. And that's why the renewing of our mind is designed to touch every area of our life. And it's an ongoing process. I said this, I'm going to say it again. A lot of times people say, well, pastor, would you pray for me that I never think another wrong thought? No, because I have to pray that you die in order for that to happen. 
Because as long as you live on this earth, you're going to be tempted with wrong thoughts. You are told to do something with your thoughts. Well, I just get tired of doing that. Yeah, and you'll, uh, to the degree you don't do it will be the degree that you're defeated. So get out of your untired self and realize if you want the victory, you're going to have to do something else. I really, listen, I, I'm no different than you are. Your flesh gets tired. Your body gets tired and it don't want to do certain things. It wants to sit up. It wants to be a couch potato. It wants to eat everything. It, it wants, instead of saying, it wants, one, it sees that piece of pie and say, well, one piece won't hurt you. But after you halfway through it, this is so good. The second to third piece, you are convinced you need it too. Because your body has a voice. Amen. Just like your mind has a voice. Your mind's voice is reasoning. Amen. Your body's voice is feelings. And we all got feelings. Amen. And we're called to do something with them. We're called to harness them. We're called, we're called to put them under the submission of the Word of God and our spirits. Come on, can I get amen? So notice it said that will keep him in perfect peace. That's what we want. Whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. Everybody say steadfast mind. Now let's read it from the NIV translation. It says that will keep him in perfect peace whose, mind, whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. I about to say steadfast. So this is what we're talking about, the steadfast mind. You will keep him in perfect peace whose minds are steadfast. Because he trusts in you. Now let's look at the Amplified Translation. It says, Y'all will keep him in perfect. You will keep in perfect and constant peace the ones whose mind is steadfast. That is, committed and focused on you, on God, in both inclination and character. Because he trusts and takes refuge in you or in God with hope and confident expectation. Woo. You know, the word of God gives us confident expectation. But it's only the steadfast mind, the mind that is steadfast on him, that is going to have that, co that constant expectation. Because things bid for our thoughts. You know, all you have to do is see something and your thought goes after it. Come on. I can tell you, if a deer ran across this front stage today or a bird flew in here or something, I, I lost you for the next at least two or three minutes. Come on, I lost you because what you saw affected your mind. Come on. And it's everything from who's going to get that or how did that get in here, but you ain't heard nothing I said. All, you, all, all you're thinking about now is what you just saw. Come on, am I telling the truth? Hallelujah. So what we have to understand is that our, our eyes and what we see does affect our mind. This is why in order to have a steadfast mind, part of that key is keeping the Word of God before our, our thought life. Before our eyes and before our thought life. This is why Proverbs, you can write this down, chapter 4, verse 20. They won't put this up. It says, My son, attend to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not depart out of your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For their life to those that find them. And medicine to all their flesh. And so we, we find here this same uh, thing that the scripture is saying in Isaiah 26 3 so the next slide is going to define steadfast because this is what we want the steadfast mind in finishing this, this series on eliminating fear you will find the steadfast mind is something that God wants us to have it says because in it we'll have peace because we trust in God the mind that is stayed on him or is steadfast is the mind that will have perfect peace a wandering mind does not have peace a mind that does not stay on God's word does not have peace but the mind that is stayed on him in other words you keep bringing it back you're replacing the wrong thoughts with the right ones you speak it and you change that image and you begin to focus on that trust in God that's a steadfast mind you will have the perfect peace in that peace where peace is fear isn't come on where peace is fear isn't so let's define the word steadfast it means resolutely firm it means an unwavering. It means unchanging. It means to stand firm, settled. It means focused. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
That's what steadfast means. So a mind that is controlled by the Word of God brings supernatural peace in our life. This is what it's saying. When our minds are resolutely firm, unwavering, unchanging. In other words, thoughts come and thoughts go. You, when thoughts come, you just cannot let them. Just like, listen, birds can fly over your head. You just can't let them make a nest in your hair. Now, wouldn't you and I look a mess? We came in and said, well, what bird built in his head this morning? But, you know, in our thoughts, you would not, you, you know what? You can't keep birds from flying over your head, but you can make them, you can keep them from making a nest in your hair. And I say that because you can't keep thoughts coming to your mind from coming to your mind all the time. But you can keep them from having residency in your life so that you're just controlled and you're, and you're frozen by those thoughts. You can tell when a, per, when a person's thoughts are frozen by something other than the Word of God. You just look at their face. You look at their body language. You look at their words. Come on. And we've all been there and we've all done that. We've all acted scared. We've all been in fear before. I'm talking about how to eliminate it. None of us want it, but we got to know that just because we don't want it doesn't mean that it is automatically going to leave. What I'm saying is you may not keep fearful thought, thoughts from coming uh, to your mind, but you can keep them from dominating you by opening your mouth and changing the thoughts and replacing them with God's Word, which has power over those negative thoughts and those negative words. Romans chapter 8, turn that with me this morning, Romans chapter 8, and we want to look at verses 5 and 6 to begin with. In the King James Version, it says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. What is your flesh? Your, your, your flesh, you could say it like this, your flesh is not just your body, it is your body, but you could say it like this, it's the in, unregenerate part of you. And so in other words, the part of you that's not saved. How many know that your mind is not saved unless it's renewed? And so it is, until it's renewed, it's still part of your unregenerate part of you. The part that's not changed yet. The unsaved part of you. Your spirit can be saved. But your mind, your will, your intellect and emotions and your body may not be. So they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. And they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. How many know we need to think after the things of the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Okay, verse 6 says, To be carnally minded is death. In other words, to think after the flesh, it produces death in our life. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To think after, to think carnal thoughts or worldly thoughts or fleshly thoughts or the thoughts that come from the world that we live in it produces death in our life. Produces death. But to be spiritually minded, to think after the Word of God, produces life and peace. Woo! Glory to God. So the battle is about a six foot... I'm sorry. Your, uh, the battle is about six inches of territory between your two ears. That's the battleground. It's called your mind. And I said it's called your mind. Praise the Lord. And so, we're, what are we called to do? Everybody say, renew it. Amen. Everybody say, have a steadfast mind. Amen. Come on. So, we want to read this from the Passion Translation. We're going to go verses 5 through 7, though. And it says, for those who are motivated by the flesh only pursue what benefits themselves. Whoo! Well, Pastor, I'm just telling you, I'm real spiritual. Bless God. Don't tell me I'm not spiritual. Well, we'll just see. We'll just see what you're running after. Are you doing things that benefit the kingdom, that benefit God? Or is it all about you and... Now, see, God don't mind you having things. God just minds the things having you. So those who are motivated by the flesh only pursue what benefits themselves. But those who live by the impulses of the Holy Spirit are motivated to pursue spiritual realities. Woo, pretty awesome. For the mindset of the flesh is death. That's right. The mindset, that says it well, the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset controlled by the Spirit finds life and peace. Verse 7, in fact, the mindset focused on the flesh fights God's plan. 
and refuses to submit to his direction because it cannot. Mm. Because everybody say cannot. You know, your flesh cannot, your flesh cannot please God. If you're in the flesh, you cannot please God. But if you are in the spirit, then in other words, if you obey the word of God and 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 make your body submit to doing the will of God, then you can please God. It produces life and peace. See, your body is not you. It's the call that gets you around out here. Amen. The real you is your spirit. The reason you need a body is because we live in a physical world. Our body is the, is the vehicle with which carries our spirit around. But God never intended for us to live solely fleshly, carnally, amen, or controlled by worldliness. He designed us to renew our minds so that we think differently, understand we're spirit beings with the life, nature, and power of God, and then control our bodies through those means. Doesn't mean we can't have fun. It just means we change the fun we have. So a lot of times people say, well, you know, uh, you know, does that mean I can't drink? No, it, it means this. You can drink. You just have to, ch- you just have to change drinking partners and, and who you're drinking with. In other words, how many know the Holy Ghost, come on, will give you a good drink? You can get filled up with the Spirit. Let Him be your drinking part. Be filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking into yourself, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart unto God. Now, all of us are at different places in our life, and here's the danger. You have people that, if you've got a healthy church, you're going to have people just like the church of uh, the Corinthian church. They have people that was the most ungodly. You know what Corinthians actually means? It means corruption. So we got, really, we got a letter written to first and second corruptions. Because that was the most pagan society. I mean, they, and they, they had religion. But their religion was in the form of prostitution. And those things involve demon worship and prostitution, amen, and illicit sex and all those things. That was their church. And now people got saved and they come to church and they used to go to their church and they got drunk and they had sex. And now they got saved, and Paul has to write to them and say, Oh, well, okay, this is why we have to change drinking partners, and this is why we gotta make we gotta we gotta let you know that the what you did before is not the way you do it now. Come on. So in a healthy church, you're gonna have people that come in from all that you're gonna have people that have been smoking dope, you're gonna have people that have have been that you know Jack Daniels is their best friend or or or, or bud or whatever. I'm not putting you down. I'm just saying that's a reality. And we're not to throw stones at you. We're to help you to change and conform to God. Because what's going to happen is if you stay in the condition you are, a couple of things are going to happen. If you stay in the condition you are, you're going to be defeated. The devil is going to eat your lunch, take take your lunch, eat your lunch, and pop the bag in your face, and you're going to be defeated and wonder why that nothing works for you in your life. Because at some point, you're going to have to figure out, and and this is why you got to come to a church that teaches you the Word of God. Not condemns you, but lets you know that's going to kill you. Because that's called walking in the flesh. Doesn't mean God doesn't love you. Because I call it out, doesn't mean I don't love you. I love you enough to tell you the truth, just like you would your child that's getting ready to touch the hot stove. You don't know saying, so you go ahead and touch that. I'll teach you a lesson. You don't say that to your young child that knows no butter. You take them all that and say, no, don't do that, honey. If you have to scream and say, don't do that, honey. Sometimes people say, you're pretty passionate, Pastor Chris. You're always yelling. You're always, uh, I'm passionate. Praise the Lord. Somebody got to blow the trumpet. Amen. And a lot of you, you're not touching the stove anymore. You done all, you're away from that. But my passion needs to get over on you so you can know how to help other people that, that, that you run into in life. Not that we put them down, but we're trying to help them. We're trying to get them in the plan of God for their life. 
Hallelujah. So we're not controlled by wrong thinking. Wrong thinking gets us go back in that same thing. This is why you got, it's called the washing of the, the washing of the water of the word. Because our minds need to be washed. And our minds need to be washed. Brainwashed is in the, in the right sense with God's word. With God's word. And brains need to be washed with God's word so we can think right. Because thinking right will produce the victory in our life. Amen. God's not mad at you. He's trying to help us. And the truth is we all need help in this. Ultimately, we have to be the ones that do it, though. What do you mean we all need help in this? Having the right thoughts, thinking the right thoughts. We all, we, listen, we all need help in this. But ultimately, you and I are the ones that can, only ones that can do it for ourselves. But the truth is, did you know there's help? There's help. And I want, and, and it, I want you to understand part of that help comes in the form of the local church. Amen. Part of the help that you and I need come in the form of the local church. Because you know what the best definition of the local church is? Is this. It's a school you go to to relearn how to live again and you don't graduate till you die. See, when I, 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 I'm sorry to tell this story on myself, but, you know, if I talk about me, you can't get mad. If I talk about you, you can get mad. Hey, uh, Gabe, you're, you're in college right now, second year. Is that correct? Good job. Praise the Lord. You're doing good. You're chaplain at the school and everything. Great job. Praise the Lord. Y'all put your hands together for that. Amen. Yeah. See, when I was his, how old are you, Gabe? 19. When I was his age... <clears throat> When I was his age, I was an idolater. What does you mean an idolater? I worship hunting and fishing. Now, before all the wives poke their husbands in the, in the, in the rib and say, see, you're hunting and fishing. Now, hunting and fishing is not wrong. It just cannot be your God. Right. Nothing, nothing needs to be your God except God himself. In other words, what you put first in your life is your God if it's not God himself. So it could be anything. It could be money. There's a lot of people. What did Jesus say? There's number one temptation for the whole, for, for, for every believer is the temptation of mammon. Putting money. Money controlling our life instead of God. Oh boy, it got quiet in here on that. Money controlling your life instead of God. God said you can't serve. Jesus said you can't serve mammon and God. Because one's going to be your Lord. And so... The truth is, at 19, it's nothing matter with hunting and fishing. Praise God. It just doesn't need to be your Lord. So I was chasing my own dream, doing my own thing back then. But the truth is, now today, all of us, no matter who we are, have to uh, face the reality that wherever we're at, we have to ask ourselves, who's going who's to be our Lord? Who's directing our steps? Is it us? Is it something? Is it things? Or is it God himself? And so, in 1986, at the age of 24, when I made Jesus Christ the Lord of my life, everything changed. It changed because I surrendered to Him, and then I learned what the Bible said. Now, here's where I wanted to go on this. See, when I was that age, this, when I was 18, man, I couldn't wait to get out of school. Anybody in the boat that was like me couldn't wait to get out of school? Because you wouldn't go and go to college. Everybody say, thank God for higher education. See, I'm not against higher education, but just, when I mean higher education, don't let somebody brainwash you about the way of the world, because there's a lot of schools that, talk, that, will take, that take you away from God. If they try to take you away from God, that's fooey. I'm not against higher education. But there's a lot of people, listen to what I'm getting ready to say, educating their heads at the expense of their hearts. Come on, that's the danger. When you educate your head at the expense of your heart, in other words, you educate yourself away from God and try to talk you out of God. There's a lot of people that go off and, and they get off. It doesn't have to be, but they do. So here's my, here's my thing. I, I had it all made up. I don't want no higher education. I just can't get, I, why, do I, why do I need all that? Because all I'm going to do is I'm going to make enough money that I can hunt and fish and enjoy life. Big, man, everybody say big vision. And it's everybody else laugh. Praise the Lord. That, 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 but that's where I was. So I could care less about, about that. 
Because I didn't see, listen, I couldn't see how what I learned in school is going to help me to go any further. Because I'm not going to need algebra and calculus in the duck blind. Come on. That's, that's my big vision. Okay. But here's, here's what I found out. Now, I got somewhere to go with this. I found out this, that that's wrong. Okay. Now, I might not need it in the duck blind. I might not even need it offshore shark fishing. But here's what I found. If we, here's the danger. When we convert that over to church, then here's what a lot of people do. They live in church the same way I lived in school. I don't need that. I'm just coming to salve my conscience. When, when it's over, when it's over, whether I'm chasing a girl, gal religion, or chasing a guy, guy religion, it, I'll sleep through half of it. it. It's boring. I'll salve my own conscience. And when I go, I just say, I've gone to church, and I'm not going to use that again because it doesn't make any difference. That's what a lot of, I, listen, a lot of people that go to church do the same thing I did with school. Both are wrong. Here's the, here's, the, here's the thing. When I found out what changed my life is when I found out that this book right here, what God did for those people, God would do for me. If I will learn what they did and do it, bless God. And when I found out this was really basic instruction before leaving earth, this is my manual, I found out I could have what they had, bless God, then I understood this, that the local church became a school that I went to to relearn how to live again, and I didn't graduate till I die. I'm still learning. This is why the local church is so important, and this is why education is so important. Just because, but see, what I'm saying is, a lot of times we have our own contribution, how we think things should work. And if we're wrong, it affects our life negatively. Let me tell you something. You might not need algebra again. You might not need calculus again. You may. If you do, you better know it. But I can tell you, the things I'm talking about right here, you're going to need to, to this afternoon, you're going to need tomorrow morning, and you're going to need five years from now if you're still on this earth. This is why the local church is so important. So I want to show you in closing today the place the local church holds to help make this happen in your life. Make what happen? Having a sound mind. Having a steadfast mind, because that's the key. And, and when we finish, we're going to receive communion today. I'm going to say it again. I want to show you the place the local church holds to help make this happen. Having a sound mind, how it adds to that, how it helps you to have a steadfast mind. How it helps you. Everybody say helps. You need help. Everybody say, I need help. We all need help. So let's position ourselves to get the help that God provided because the local church is not man's idea, it's God's idea. Jesus, in, in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, seven times he showed his care, approval, direction, and love for local churches. That's not the only places, but right there, he addressed those seven local churches. So I want to I show you that God, here's what God does. God will use the local church to... To A, create. Everybody say create. B, maintain. Everybody say maintain. And C, to help grow it. To help Say help grow it. So I'm going to put it together. God will use the local church to help create, maintain, and help grow a sound mind, a steadfast mind, an unwavering, an unchanging, a settled mind, thereby guaranteeing your victory. That's what God will use. He will use that. So when we just say, well, you know what, I'll just, I can just take or leave the local church because that's man. That's man. It's not man's plan, it's God's plan. See, it was designed to help us to relearn how to live again. And we don't graduate until we die. So, you know, the thing about it, I'm thoroughly convinced there's times that there are messages and things that come from heaven that if, if a person heard, it could have saved their life. Because our, our flesh and the devil and the world will talk us out of even coming. We'll just stay home and we'll, we'll say, well, it's not that big of a deal. I, I heard what the pastor had to say before. And yada, yada, yada. I know that would not happen to anybody here, but that what happens all over the world. 
So I want to show you an example of this, how powerful this is in Joshua. Turn with me in Joshua chapter 5. Joshua in chapter 5, Joshua and the children of Israel are, ready, are getting ready to go into the promised land. They cross the river Jordan and they're getting ready to go into Jericho at the command of God through the servant Joshua. And we find them here now. So what are we talking about? How God is going to use the local church to create, maintain, and help grow a sound or steadfast mind in your life. So I want to use a couple examples in the Bible that, that correlate to you and I today. Because the things that were written aforehand, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, the things that were written aforehand, talking about the Old Testament, were written for our learning. That through hope and comfort of those scriptures, we, the, the, that through patience and comfort of those scriptures, we may have hope or an expected end. So in other words, they were written for us to learn by. Can I get an Amen. So Joshua 5, and we'll see here at verse 2, At that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel of the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcise the children of Israel at the heel of the foreskins. Everybody say covenant. See, circumcision was a sign of an Old Testament covenant that God had with his, his, his children of Israel. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise, verse 4, all the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war died in the wilderness, by the way, after they came out of Egypt. And now all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness by the way that they came forth out, of Egypt, them had not been circumcised. Once again, why this is a big deal is because circumcision was a sign of the covenant that God gave Abraham to the Jewish people. Verse 6, it said, or the children of Israel, at verse 6, for the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till they, all the people that were men of war which came out of Egypt were consumed because they believed, they obeyed not the voice of the Lord unto whom the Lord swear that he would not show them the land which the Lord swear unto the fathers that he would give us a land that floweth with milk and honey. So you know the story before we finish reading. We find out this, that God said, I gave you the land, go and possess it. We know that what they sent 12 spies in, 10 came back with the evil report saying, and this was the evil report, that we can't do it. What God said we could do, we can't do. That's the evil report. All the people that were associated with those 10 spies and all the, the camp, all those people that were, the, were adult, you just would say adults at that time, died in the wilderness over that, that, that trip. They died because they, they disobeyed God. They said, we can't do what God says we can do. There was two. Joshua and Caleb said, we can do this. Try to talk the people into it, but no, they couldn't. They survived, and now with them, a whole new generation has come. And they crossed the Jordan, and now they're getting ready to go into Jericho, the promised land. But this young generation hasn't been circumcised, the sign of the covenant. And here's what happened in verse 7. It says, And their children whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised. Talking about, everybody say covenant. Covenant's important with God. It has to do with relationship. It has to do with being his and him being ours. Come on. For they were uncircumcised because they were not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass when, look at verse 8. And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the, the people that they abode in their places in the camp till they were made whole. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Therefore, the name of this place is called Gilgal unto this day. And I know a lot of you are here today and say, My God, what in the world? How are you tying this to us, Pastor Chris? Well, I'm tying it to what the, 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 what the place that the local church has to do with have us having a renewed mind. Come on. And a steadfast mind in producing victory in our life. Now, I want us to read verses 7 through 9 again and focus there. We'll come back here. And their children whom he raised up in their stead, whom them Joshua circumcised. For they were uncircumcised because they were not circumcised by them by the way. 
And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their places in the camp until they were, were whole. Everybody say, were made whole. And then the Lord said to Joshua, This day I have rode away the reproach of Egypt from off of you. Therefore, the name of this place is called Gilgal unto this day. The word Gilgal means rolling. It actually, once again, he, he explains it here. It means to roll away your reproach. So where does that come to us? Well, if we look at today for us, has it applied to us? In Colossians 2, verse 11, it tells us this. In whom, in talking about Jesus Christ, you also are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. It's talking about we're circumcised in our hearts. We're circumcised in our hearts. And when we do, it's a, it has the power through salvation and that circumcision for us to be able to say, we're in covenant with God. We can say no to the flesh. The flesh doesn't have to have power over us because we know what God has done for us. This is why uh, Philippians chapter 3 verse 3 says that we in Christ Jesus are the true. One translation says we are the true circumcision. We're the true, everybody say true circumcision. Who worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. We ain't got confidence in the flesh. We ain't circumcised. We don't have to be circumcised in the flesh. We got to be circumcised in our hearts. And with that, we get circumcised in our heart, enter in a covenant relationship with God when we make Jesus Christ the Lord of our life. So what does this mean for us in here? Let me tell you what it means for us and how the local church plays an important part in us having a sound mind and having a steadfast mind. The local, the local church is what this is teaching us is one thing is the local church is a place of salvation. It's a place of salvation. You learn about salvation here. You, in, in other words, it's a, it's a place of true circumcision of the heart and, and, where we not only can get in covenant with God, but we learn about that covenant. The, that should happen in a local church. It doesn't just have to. I, I realize, listen, for all the people that say, oh, my God, I didn't get saved in a local church. Listen, you don't have to get saved in a local church. But the local church is a place you can, that salvation, you can receive salvation is a place where you learn it. What it is. Not just receive it, but, but what it is. And you, you understand your covenant with God. The local church is a, is a place of finding out also of who you are, what you possess, and what you can do, because now you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And until we find out who we are, what we have, and what we can do, we're going to live at a lower level. Can I get an amen? This is why the local church is so important. It is a place, notice where it says, verse 8, and they came to pass when they had done circumcising. You can say, it came to pass after the people were saved, that they abode in their places in the camp until they were made whole. Here's where that goes. The, the, it, the local church is a place that you become whole in. Come on. It's a place you abide, your planet, as Psalms 92 says, your planet, and the, they that be planted in the house of God shall flourish in the courts of their God. It's a place of planting. It's a place that you become whole in. Amen. It's a place through the renewing of your mind and acting on the word of God, you become whole in because you're in a place that can produce that wholeness in you. See, we need our own camp. We need our own company. As Acts chapter 4 verse 32 said, the apostles were persecuted and it says they left and went to their own company and reported what the chief priests said. There was a place of, of power. It was a place of, of reminding you of who you are. It's a place of safety. Come on. It's all those things. But, we, 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 but the local church is a place you become whole in because it teaches you how to renew your mind and act on the Word of God. The local church becomes your Gilgal. In other words, where your, it's a place where you get the revelation, where your reproach, your shame is removed, where your past is removed, and your future is made clear because of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And you learn about him. You learn about what he said. You learn about what he's done and how he makes that real to you. And the local church is designed to be, to be your Gilgal, the place through revelation of God that your reproach, your shame, your disgrace, your past 
is rolled away. And your future is made clear and bright. The local church is a vital part in helping you, therefore, to create. Everybody say create. To maintain. Everybody say maintain. And grow a sound, steadfast mind. Everybody say a sound, steadfast mind. To help grow it. So you go home. You study, you pray, you spend time with God. I come back and add fuel to the fire. I have out ammunition. You find out about in your owner's manual the weapons you have. And what I do every service, I hand out the ammunition so that you got more to use. Amen. In other words, when the devil comes to get you, you ain't, you ain't fighting against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. So you learn how to think right so you can act right, talk right right and be right that's the place and the value of the local church because there's a spirit here called the Holy Ghost and, and, and it gets off on us a spirit of faith gets off on us so we can live the life that God called us to live not our old way that we used to live not intimidation and fear listen I ain't who I used to be and neither are you 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6, when the, says when the Spirit of God comes upon you, you'll be changed into another man. And that's where we need that a corporate anointing. When we come together, that Spirit gets on off. We leave out of here. We go to Walmart in this place, and we're reminded of how to take the Word of God and live it out. We're in the midst of temptation of doing something wrong, looking and thinking wrong. We say, no, uh-uh, uh -uh, devil, not in my mind. Uh-uh, not today not tomorrow, not ever in Jesus' name. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. And then when you have opportunity to witness and share, the Holy Ghost reminds you of words that have been spoken and the boldness of God comes upon you and you're changing to another man because you've been in a place where there's been fire, there's been anointing, and now that is not just on the pastor and not just on a few, it's on you. Let me show you how that works in the local church. I got one more story, and then we're going to receive communion. Are you ready? Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Are you getting anything this morning? Thank God for all you on the, online this morning. We call you blessed. 1 Kings chapter 19. Hallelujah. Oh, I got a good one for you. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 19 through 21. So he departed thence and found Elisha. So Elijah was told by God to go and find Elisha because anoint Elijah. Elisha, because Elisha, if he does what God is saying through the prophet Elijah, he's going to get and be his predecessor he's going to be he's go, he's going to succeed him in ministry and he's going to have a double portion of ministry in his life everybody say double god will give you double for your trouble Come on. So he departed thence, and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he passed with the 12, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. Just in case we don't know what a mantle is, mantle is like a cloak, but it represents the calling, the charge, the ministry, and the anointing of God. And how many know that happens to be? The mantle is something that happens to be something that you learn about in the local church, if you're in the right local church. The call of God, the charge of God, the ministry of God, and the anointing of God. Here's what Elijah did. Elijah took his mantle and threw it on Elisha. And then Elisha left the oxen and ran after Elijah. I imagine so. But listen, and he said, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I'll follow you. And he said unto them, go back again, for what have I done to thee? Now, we're going to get back to this in just one moment, but listen. And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of oxen and gave them to the people, and they did eat. And he rose and he went after. That means he followed. Everybody say followed. He followed Elijah and ministered on him, or one translation says he became the, the, the servant of Elisha or served him. How many know that's what the highest call of God is, to be a servant of God? Come on. 
So what I want us to understand here is just like Elisha had to follow Elijah to do the will of God. Listen to what I'm getting ready to say. We have to follow Jesus Christ. Just like Elisha, Elisha had to follow Elijah. When he found out about the call, the anointing, the ministry, he had to follow him in order to get it. I want us to understand in here today, to, in order to do the will of God, that's what he had to do. So we have to follow Jesus Christ. And it will, and this is where the local church comes in a big place in it. Because it is there where you find about the call, the charge, the ministry, and the anointing of God. At least you see it lived out. You see, you should see it lived out. You see it talked about and illustrated in our lives. Not the only place, but it's a, a place. And it's a place where it's created that sound mind or steadfast mind. And I want to I want to remind you that one of the definitions of the word steadfast is the word settled. Everybody say settled. So here's what's going to happen. In order, so just like Elisha had to follow Elijah, we are going to have to follow Jesus Christ. And the local church was designed to help us follow Jesus Christ. It ain't Jesus Christ, but it helps us follow Jesus Christ. It, 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 and it helps us to understand the things that we need in order to, to answer the call, to be in the ministry that God has us to, and, and, and operate in the Lord of God. You know why? Because it helps produce a sound mind or a steadfast mind. Steadfast means settled. So it, here's what happens to all of us. We all get confronted. We all get confronted just like, e, because whether you know it or not, listen, I'm talking to you right now. Look at your neighbor and say, listen up, pastor's talking to you. Because I want you to know, you, all we read all those stories in there, I want to bring it home today. I want to bring it home today. He's plowing oxen. He's minding his own business. But God's got another plan for his life. I want you to know you're minding your own business long enough. God's got another plan for your life. And God took Elijah and he said, you go down there and anoint him. And he took him and he went by him and threw his coat on him. And it rested on him. He's like, my God, what does that mean? So when he did, he had to go back and say, he said, uh, oh, oh, he's like we all say, um, um, let me go back and and, and, and throw a party to the host, and then I'm coming and follow you. Well, we remember Jesus talking about something like that. He said that he that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of the kingdom of God. Am I right? Listen, it can take us so by surprise. Because we mind his own business. Think about it. He minded his own business. He's doing his own thing. Going his own way. But God had another plan for his life. God just revealed that other plan for his life. But I find it really amazing. Sometimes we think the pastors are, oh, I'll tell you what, that Pastor Chris, he's, he's a hard man. He, he talked about things today that, I mean, it just rubbed me wrong. I mean, he, he, it, it try, it, it was, I know he's trying to help me, but my God, he said something about drinking. He said something about living in sin. He said something about this. It, it, was, it was really hard. Now, I'm just trying to tell you that God's got a plan for your life, and you ain't getting there by plowing the, by plowing the field. God is, is here to throw his anointing on you, throw his power on you. The local church is designed to get it off of just the head and get it on the body so the body can do something good. So I want to, this is where I'm getting to, oh, oh, listen, so can you imagine, can you imagine, where, this is why, you know, Pastor Chris is so hard. Uh, this, I know you're not thinking that, but a lot of people could. And uh, imagine how hard people thought Elisha was. Because here's what happened. I want to put it on verse 20, and I, I want us to read it from the Amplified Translation. And then he left the oxen and ran after Elijah. So what happened? Elijah threw his mantle on and said, God, hey, you're you to follow me. And said, here's what Elisha said. Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I'll follow you. And Elijah tested Elijah, said, go on back. For what, I, what have I done for you? What have I done to you? Sell it for yourself and walked away. 
In other words, he left that ball in his court. He, Elijah, done what he's supposed to do. How many know that when I leave here today, the truth is, you're going to have to sell it for yourself. Because I delivered the ammo, bless God. I delivered what God had for me to deliver. But you're going to have to sell it for yourself, whether you're going to do answer God's call, for, go follow God in his ministry, or do it your own way. Sell it for yourself. And that ain't being, that ain't being hard. That is exactly what he did. Look at your neighbor and say, sell it for yourself. How many of the truth is, we got to sell it for ourselves? Because the call of God and the anointing of God and the ministry of God and the will of God for your life is so big, God delivers it and gives you the power to be able to do it. This is what the local church was designed to do to help you to see that. But then the minister has to just walk and say, well, sell it for yourself. Oh, that's... That don't sound very, very compassionate, Pastor Chris. Let me tell you something. There comes a time we have to sell it for ourselves. That we are selling it and we're going to do it God's way. And it begins with our mind. It begins with us agreeing. Because the sole thing of your mind is just to learn to agree with God. If you will learn nothing else today, let the sole thing be about your mind. Just learn to use your mind to agree with God with. Is to be subservient and submit itself to the will of God. And that's what we have to do. When it comes a time that we have to sell it for ourselves and, all, and to do it God's way, and it begins with that thinking. The local church helps to point you. Come on, Brother Ryan. And the whole praise and worship team can come because we're going we're gonna to receive communion in just one moment. Well, whoever's supposed to come today? Whoever's supposed to come today? Y'all, y'all, sell it for yourself. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, here's what, the, here's what I'm saying. The local church helps point you to God in his way. But ultimately, it's between you and him. You have to sell it for yourself. You have to sell it for yourself. Amen. Doing it God's way will produce a sound mind, a steadfast mind, and helps you answer the call and receive. Listen, helps you answer. If you will do it God's way. It will help you answer the call and receive the anointing of God to walk in it. Amen. Now, I know they, l- listen, I'm not, I'm not putting them down. I told them to come up. But I know it's just like the deer just run across the front. It's just like the bird that just flew in here and everybody looking at it. I ain't hear nothing the pastor said. And it's a, it, here's what I said. Doing it God's way will produce a sound mind, a steadfast mind, and help you answer the call and receive the anointing of God and walk in it. And after all, that's what we need, but you got to sell it for yourself. But you know what? I'll tell you something else that we all have to settle for ourselves. We have to settle for ourselves is Jesus our Lord. I think about the mighty words that Jesus said. He talked to his disciples. They were following him. But he asked the question, he said this, who do men say that I am? What's the hearsay? What's the hearsay? Well, some say that you're the prophet. Some say you're this and that, the other. And then Jesus asked the all important question that he really asked to all of us. But who do you say that I am? Why does it have to be us? Because everything with God goes back to person personal relationship a personal walk with him personally know him you can't get in heaven through your on your mother's coat strings your grandmother's coat strings or anybody else's you get in heaven through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ yourself and that's something you have to settle for yourself nobody else can do it for you but this is why the local church is so important because it helps you make that connection That whether you feel that anointing come upon you or not, you know that there's been times that God's presence, His Spirit, and His power has touched your life. It brings revelation to us. That's what the local church is supposed to do. So that we know the call, the purpose, the ministry, and the will of God. And God has said, I showed it to you. I'm inviting you to come, but you got to sell it for yourself. Jesus is inviting you to be part of his family. 
The scripture says, as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. So there's only one way to become a child of God, to be born again, to be saved, and that's by receiving Jesus Christ. Contrary to popular belief, there's only one way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So what about you today? Who do you say Jesus is? It's not enough that I say he's Lord. If I, if I, see, the Holy Spirit has to reveal that to you, but this is why I'm so passionate about it, because he changed my life. Just like there's, I, I could have person after person come up here and testify how he's changed their life. You don't have to feel like you're left out. See, a lot of times people come and go. They feel they're left out. That's for them. But today God has thrown that cloak over you, and he's asking you to sell it for yourself. And enough with excuses. I got to go back and tell this one. I got to do this. Let me clean myself up. Enough with the excuses. Today is somebody's day to say, I'm done with it. Jesus, you're going to be my Lord. I hear you. I'm going to receive from you. And this is what this local church is here for. It's here to win and disciple people to Christ.